Welcome to the Brigham Young University Family History Library webinar series. My name is Sean Firmage. I will be your host for this webinar. Today we will be pleased to hear from Catherine Grant, who will be giving a presentation titled, What Every Family Tree User Should Know About find Name Finding Apps. After years on the sidelines, Catherine started doing family history and discovered somewhat to her surprise that she loved it. Her specialty is mentoring new family historians and helping them find success and maybe even avoid some of the mistakes that she's made. Catherine teaches Sunday classes at the BYU Family History Library. She also presents at Riverton Saturday seminars and other family history events. Her column on family history ran in the Nauvoo Times for about a year and is still available online. Catherine works for the LDS Church as a technical writer with a focus on usability and process improvement. Besides family history, she loves uplifting music, thought-provoking books, and spring lilacs. Catherine, we'll turn the time over to you. Great, Sean, thank you so much. Okay, we've just got to get our screen shared here. Okay, great. Well, hi everybody and welcome to our webinar today. As we've seen, technology has its blessings and challenges and appreciate your patience as we've gotten started with this. So today's webinar is about a very important topic and it's one that's become especially of interest to people with a, a great number of name finding apps being made available to Family Tree users. So maybe you have heard something like this. A friend has approached you and said something along the lines of, hey, have you tried such and such an app? It's amazing. In a matter of minutes, I found over a hundred names for temple work. So name finding apps have become popular in the last few years for doing family history. But interestingly enough, they're also widely misunderstood and even misused. And that misuse has some unexpected consequences. So today I'm hoping that we can shed some light on those consequences and talk about how to avoid them. So this webinar I hope will be of help to three main audiences. The first is, if I can get the slide to advance, there we go. The first is for uh, people who are using the apps or may co be considering using the apps. The second audience is for consultants who help others to find family names. And then finally, developers of name finding apps or those who may be considering developing a name finding app. So let's look at what we're going to be talking about. Here's a short overview. First of all, we're going to get on the same page as far as what we're talking about in this particular webinar when we say name finding apps. Then we're going to talk about some common misconceptions that people have about name finding apps. Then we'll look at some unintended consequences. And then finally, we'll look at an alternative approach. So let's go ahead and dive in. What do we mean in this webinar when we talk about name finding apps? Basically, we're talking about apps that crawl Family Search Family Tree to find names with green temples. So why is there such an appeal for name finding apps? I am guessing that if you joined this webinar, you've probably had more than one friend talk to you about their favorite name finding app and how much they love it. So why do people love these apps so much? Well, name finding apps say that they will save you time, that they will reduce the effort required for family history, that they will eliminate the tedium, and who doesn't want that, right? And then finally, they promise to make family history fast and easy. Now for a lot of us, especially if we're just starting out in family history, Family history can seem like kind of a black box and we hear people talk about how they, you know, spent years trying to break down a brick wall and we might look at some genealogical problem and just be completely flummoxed. And so what's not to love about an app that says that it's going to take away all those problems? But there's a little bit more to it. So let's look at some of the common misconceptions that that uh, happen when people use these apps. And it's important to point out that 
people don't promote these misconceptions on purpose. In other words, no user or developer for that matter says, I think I'll spread some misconceptions. No, it's always when we have misconceptions, one of the reasons we have them is that we don't know their misconceptions. So, but it's been my experience that these misconceptions lead to both using name finding apps and using the apps tends to reinforce the misconceptions. So let's look at a few of those misconceptions. So first of all, there are three misconceptions that tend to go hand in hand. The first is that the church is the entity that provided the names and family tree. If we think that, it's not a very far leap to believe that therefore, if the church provided the names, well, they must be verified and ready for temple work. It's a logical conclusion, right? And then finally, if we believe that the church has provided the names and that they're ready for temple work, well, it's not too much of a stretch to believe that Family Tree was supposed to be an ongoing source of temple names. But let's take a look at what the truth is about each of those three things. So the first misconception that the church provided the names in family tree uh, is not true. And where the names came from was users, interestingly enough. And that's something that is very often misunderstood, especially by new users to family search. Because the, the Family Search website is sponsored by the church, and so it's logical to think that the church actually provided those names. But what the church and Family Search did was they gathered names that were provided by users. And I have another webinar that goes into a lot more detail on that, so I won't go into a lot of detail here. But the important point is to realize that the names in Family Tree were ultimately contributed by users. Here's an example for those of you who might have remembered, might remember the four generation program of the last century. Uh, we sent in our family history on a pedigree chart, or excuse me, family group sheets such as you see here. So this is an actual pedigree, or why do I call it that? It's an actual family group sheet for James Waterfield. And then he's got a couple of girls here, a couple of daughters, but notice that there's no wife and there's a half sister to these other daughters here, but the information is scanty. Uh, Rose Hannah has more information, Mary not so much. But before we judge people too harshly, you know, we might look at this record and go, wow, that's, that's kind of shoddy work. That wasn't, you know, very complete. But remember, this sheet was prepared way before the days of the internet. Uh, the person may not have even had access to a typewriter back then, for those of you who know what typewriters are, since we don't use those so much anymore. But this person, I have no doubt that they were doing the very best that they could. They were following the, the uh, council to collect names for four generations and to submit them to the church. And to be honest with you, many of the names that are submitted to Family Tree are about of this quality. And so it's harder to see when the name is digital. You know, we can look at this family group sheet and say, oh, wow, there's a lot of stuff missing. But when you look at this same name in family tree, it's not quite so obvious what's missing. And so we don't want to be judgmental or critical of people who have put names in family tree. By and large, whether they did it through an old four generation program or whether they're doing it today, they're doing the best they can with the information and the skills that they have. For any of you who have indexed, you may be familiar with the old extraction program, which was the forerunner of the indexing program. And many extracted names were also added to Family Tree. Well, we see that the neat screen in Family Tree, and it's all digital and beautiful and easy to read. And sometimes we don't stop to think about where that information came from. Well, it came from a record somewhat like this. Uh, some are maybe a little easier to read, some are a lot harder, but they were in many cases handwritten records made at the time of the event by a person who may or may not have had an extensive, extensive education. Again, people were doing their best, but this kind of information ended up in family tree. And so you can see that, it, that the information varied widely in quality. 
So did the church verify all the names in Family Search Family Tree? Actually, they didn't, not because they probably wouldn't have wanted to, but because it simply wouldn't be feasible. With all the names, Family Tree right now, as, as we're going to see in a little bit, has 1.1 billion names in it. So it just wouldn't have been feasible for the church to uh, get the staff and the manpower to verify every single one of those names. The truth is, we, the users, are responsible for verifying the names in Family Tree. Uh, many of those names that we just looked at became green temples in Family Tree. So those extracted records or names submitted with the old three and four generation program. So a lot of uh, names ended up in Family Tree with green temples looking like they need temple work when they actually don't. And that's an important thing to be aware of when you're using a name finding app. In my experience, about 80% of the green temples that I find in Family Tree do not need temple work. And there's four main reasons for that that are listed here on the screen. The first one is they might be a duplicate. And so if they are a duplicate of a record that already has temple work attached, well then that work doesn't need to be done. The, the records just need to be merged. The records might also have errors in vital information. As an example, I uh, found a record in Family Tree that had come from a, an early submission that had the uh, birthplace a birthplace of Cat Hearth in Chat or excuse me in Cambridgeshire, England, and there was no such place as Cat Hearth. But because the the last name of that person on the record was one of my family names. And because it was close to where that family lived, which was actually the place called Chatris, I thought, uh, you know, there's something's going on here. I'm going to check this out. So I actually found the original submission and was able to determine that the person had meant Chatris and not Cat Hearth. But because of the error in that vital information, a duplicate did not come up when I did the search. As soon as I corrected the error, the duplicate came up, and this woman's temple work had already been done. So errors in vital information can cause problems. There can be relationship errors. Not too long ago, I found a mother having children when she was four. Well, yeah, not, not so likely, right? So there was a problem there. Even though those names had green temples on them, they weren't ready for temple work. Another common problem is that people will put in names maybe based on a census or they'll come from extraction where they'll, they won't have a death date because they don't know it. And so the person shows up with a green temple, but a little more research shows that they died before eight and all they need is sealing to parents. So green temple names may not need work for any of these reasons. And a name finding app will normally not be able to distinguish this. They, they may tell some duplicates, but on most of the rest of them, these other three bullet points, they don't, they, they don't have the programming power or the algorithms or whatever to determine whether those, those problems exist. The last misconception of those three is that Family Tree is intended to be an ongoing source of temple names. And again, that's logical if you think that family, uh, or excuse me, that the church originally populated Family Tree with these temple names. And what's interesting is this, I found that this misconception gets passed so frequently, kind of like wildfire gossip from um, one member to another. Uh, in the place that I live, people are constantly telling each other this, saying, yeah, all you have to do is go to Family Tree and find your temple names. Isn't that awesome that the church has made it so easy? They've just handed us these names. And so, you know, the, the quote, good news gets spread around with people not realizing that it's actually a misconception. But the truth is, that Family Tree is a wonderful gift that was given to us by the church through Family Search as a place to collaborate with other researchers, a place to track temple work, and a place where we can add family names. Now, once in a while, when I talk about the problems with the data in Family Tree, 
not very often, but I have had a couple of people say, wow, it sounds to me like you're criticizing Family Tree. One person even felt like I was criticizing the prophet because the church sponsors Family Tree. But the truth is to point out the reality of the data in Family Tree isn't actually a criticism, it's actually empowering. Because if we understand the data in Family Tree, we understand better how to use it. So data issues don't mean that Family Tree is flawed or that the church did some something wrong by uh, putting this data in Family Tree. The interesting thing is that it only looks like a criticism of Family Tree to point out the data if a person thought that the data was supposed to be perfect and that Family Search had intended it to be perfect. So if you think something's perfect and then someone comes along and says it's not, well, yeah, that sounds like a criticism and it sounds like the program maybe failed. But if we realize that, as we saw on this other screen, that the purpose of Family Tree is for us to collaborate, track temple work, and add names, and it was never meant to be this perfect source of verified family names, then we realize it's not a criticism of Family Tree. So the problem isn't the Family Tree data, but the problem is actually the misconceptions that we might have about it. So two more common misconceptions that go a little bit hand in hand. One of those is that success in family history means reserving large numbers of names. And again, these are this is one of those misconceptions that is um, promoted by apps, at least the way they're used, because so many people use them to find large numbers of temple names. And then associated with that, is the misconception that family history is tedious and time consuming, and especially so if you don't have an app. So let's look a little bit closer at, the, at those two misconceptions. So does success in family history mean reserving large numbers of names? Well, actually, we've been taught in conference that that's not the case. You might remember Elder Scott's talk where he mentioned that he didn't think that um, people would be very happy beyond the veil if someone reserved a large number of names and just kept them in their temple queue. So that's a problem, and the church has actually, as many of you probably know, have, has dealt with that problem by releasing names from people's temple queues if they're older than two years. So that kind of helped take care of that problem, but still I hear people uh, you know, saying, wow, I found 400 names, or, uh, you know, it, it almost becomes a, a matter of pride, to be honest. I remember hearing a talk of, that was given in, in my stake by a young woman who had been taught to use a name finding app to just comb through Family Tree and find bunches of names. So she had used the app, she had gotten through and gotten, I don't know, a couple hundred names. And then her sister tried to use the app to crawl the tree, but the older girl had already reserved the names after the app had ran had run for a certain period of time. So the younger sister was really frustrated and discouraged because she tried to do the same thing her sister did and wasn't able to get this righteous number of, you know, huge number of names. And so another, another problem with uh, the, this misconception is that it can lead to cutting corners and not verifying the names. So people will use the app, they'll gather hundreds, and in some cases I've heard of people doing thousands of names, and then they don't verify them. They either put them in their temple queue or uh, share them with the temple system, and then other people end up doing the invalid names, which is kind of not really fair to them. So if success in family history doesn't mean reserving huge numbers of names, how would we qualify success in family history? After years of working with people and helping them get started, I've come to believe that success in family history means a consistent, diligent effort. In a way, for those of you who um, are home or visiting teachers, it's the same principle. So. Home and visiting teaching isn't a one and done. We don't just visit a person once and then say, okay, you're good for life, or even just only think about them once, you know, towards the end of the month or whatever. 
but being a good home and visiting teacher means consistent diligent effort on a regular basis and I really believe it's the same in family history. So our goal shouldn't be to, to be gathering large numbers of family names, but instead to be, be making a consistent, diligent effort. And this one, oh my goodness, please forgive me because this is actually one of my greatest concerns, uh, one that I, I just wish I could shout from the rooftops and tell people that it's a myth that family history is tedious and time consuming. Let's leave the app aside for a minute. But uh, there's just a misconception in the church that uh, a family history is tedious and time consuming. Now, it's true that some time periods and some areas of the world are more difficult than others. And I, I just, I wish I could just say to people, yeah, there's, a, everybody has places on their line like that. But, Everybody also has places on their line that are easier than others. So family history is not tedious and time consuming in and of itself or per se. What is tedious and time consuming is doing family history without the spirit. Let me give you an example. I was helping my friend Marcy get started with family history. And this was back in, before the days when, uh, this was actually quite a few years ago, and so I was kind of new to what I was doing and hadn't fully realized the power of prayer and the power of following the Spirit. So Marcy and I just met in the Family History Center, Center and sat down to work on her lines. And I said, hey, what do you want to work on? And she said, well, what about this? And so we got in there and we looked and looked and tried stuff and churned and uh, finally after, oh gosh, I would have to say it was maybe 45 minutes or an hour, we both looked at each other and said, this is not working, and actually this doesn't feel right. And I'm, it was a good learning experience that it took me that long to realize that it wasn't working, and it was tedious, and it was time consuming. And we both felt that we had not made the best use of our time. But what was interesting is that after we realized that, and then we sought the Lord and sought the inspiration of the Spirit, we felt prompted to move to a different place in her family tree and things just opened up and it was not tedious and it was not time consuming. So I really believe it's a myth and we do people a disservice when we teach them that family history is tedious and time consuming. So it's not, I mean, technology can help us, right? It can take some of the um, searching, for instance, we can search digital records so much more quickly than if we had to travel to a courthouse. But family history in and of itself only becomes tedious and time consuming when we're not going by the spirit. It can be challenging, but it won't be tedious and it won't be this terrible experience. So unintended consequences of those misconceptions. Let's take a look at some of those. Invalid or duplicate temple work, and we've actually talked a little bit about that with the, um, the high percentage of green temples that are invalid. Also, this is a problem that has just surfaced, I would say, within the last year or so, and that is using a name-finding app to take names that somebody else is actually right in the process of reserving. Whoops, that was the wrong thing to click. There we go. Okay, and then not realizing that names actually need to be added to family tree. So if we think that family tree is this pool of names that the church has provided, then we don't realize that a lot of names are missing and that we are the ones who are supposed to be adding those names. And then finally, another unintended consequence is not becoming self-sufficient in finding names because we don't think we have to, and so we don't, and so we never learn to become self-sufficient. I want to go into a little bit more detail about this problem that I mentioned of taking names that other people are currently reserving. I, I want to share two experiences that I had on that. The first is that one of my friends called me uh, almost in tears. She was Her voice was teary when she said, you know, I've been working on this such and such family, and she was pretty new to family history. 
at the time and so she was learning to do careful verification and find family and it had just been such a beautiful experience for her to finally take her own family names to the temple so she had found this family and she was very carefully putting them in family tree uh, verifying the names adding the sources and so forth and then before she could finally make the reservations somebody else came through with a green uh, a name finding app to reserve those green temples and took the names that my friend had very carefully researched and verified and this other person had not done any research or verification on the names so that's one experience that we, that uh, I know of and then that that I learned firsthand from my friend and then I had an experience the other night where I was uh, working on a name and I promise you the name had not been available in the system for more than five minutes and I think it was more than more like about three minutes when somebody else came through and got the name I was in the very process of reserving it for temple work now it's important to point out that it is not wrong to reserve a name added by somebody else that's not what I'm saying so my niece just as an example she loves doing family history and the other day she had found some names that were very difficult to find actually while she was working on our family so she found family names but she found some other names that in in that process of uh, people that it took her a while and they were tricky to find well she made the choice to put those names in family tree because she suspected that it would be very difficult for somebody else to repeat the research that she had done so she put the names in family tree but because they weren't on her line she did not reserve them so if somebody comes along and reserves those names that's exactly why she put them there so that is not a problem at all the problem arises when well I just have to ask myself is it fair to take names that somebody else has loved and labored over with no more thought than running an autom automated name finding program so to avoid this problem as you have probably noticed if you've used one of these name finding apps they don't tell at least none that I'm aware of none of the ones that I have tried tell you when the name was created and so if a name was created and the way you can tell this is by looking in the change log so over on the right hand side of the person page there's a link that says show all changes if you click that link and scroll to the bottom it will tell you when that name was created so you can tell if the name was created say within the last week or maybe even the last month it would be a nice courtesy to contact the person who uh, contributed that name and just say hey I noticed that you contributed this name they're on my family line too and I was hoping to reserve some names for the temple uh, are you okay with me reserving these names and who knows through that process you might meet a cousin that you can collaborate on research with but just doing that uh, resolves the problem of reserving names that other people are right in the process of reserving it's just you can imagine how discouraging that is especially for a new family historian to be right in the process of adding names and just have those names vanish right before their eyes as they're trying to add them so that's actually a reason that I really um, recommend not adding lots of names all at once with a name finding app but rather checking those names and checking to make sure that somebody else is not already planning to reserve those names so the another problem is that people uh, get the mindset that family history means searching in family tree for names and they don't realize names need to be added so I did some checking and got some updated figures these uh, population totals actually used to be higher but current estimates are that about a hundred to 115 billion people have lived on the earth since the beginning of human history only 1.1 billion people are in family tree so I am not really good at math but even I can figure out that this leaves probably over you know between about 99 billion and 114 billion people that probably need to be added to family tree okay granted there are not records for many people who lived uh, 
you know, back through time where either the records have been destroyed or they didn't keep them and so forth. So there are some of this uh, large group that we're not going to be able to find records for, but there are a surprisingly large number that do have records. And so a lot of people still need to be added to Family Tree, and it is an absolute joy. I don't know that I've ever felt the spirit stronger than when I find a name and actually add it to Family Tree. That person has just gone from being lost to having getting kind of in the queue, if you will, of having the opportunity to get their temple work done. Some more unintended consequences. An unfortunate one that I've noticed is relying on technology instead of the spirit. Now, let me be careful to explain what I mean there. One problem is that people tend to trust technology more than they trust themselves. I've been in information technology for about 20 or 25 years now as a web designer, um, as a database person, done different things in with technology, and I love technology. But one thing that I've noticed is that people, te technology is so miraculous to us in so many ways that we give it more credit than it deserves. We think it's maybe a little more perfect than it is. So because of that, sometimes people will trust the technology and not trust the spirit. And and usually in a case like that, it's not so much, I guess, that they don't trust the spirit, but more that they doubt the prompting that they're hearing because they think, well, why am I getting that prompting? Because the technology right on my screen that I can trust or I feel I can trust is showing me something different. And so if it's a toss up and they're not quite sure that the spirit's really speaking to them, I've seen that a lot of people will tend to go with the technology. Another issue is that technology can just make the spirit seem unnecessary. So it's not that people are blocking the spirit or ignoring the spirit. It's just that if you use a name finding app and it presents you with 400 names of people who apparently need temple work, then why do you need to follow the spirit on that? I mean, the names are right in front of you. And I, and I understand that. I can see why people would would not it would not even think not even occur to them that they would need to follow the spirit in a in a case like that because the names have just been handed to them as they see it so another challenge that comes up another unintended consequence is as i mentioned before that these misconceptions just spread like wildfire because somebody reserves 400 names or 8000 or whatever and they feel that they've experienced such great success and they can't wait to share it with everybody else. Just even in the last couple of weeks, I've seen people posting on Facebook and posting on forums and saying, hey, I found such and such this wonderful app and I reserved these hundreds of names and now I'm just so glad that I did that and you guys should try it too. So it just spreads because it sounds so fantastic and it sounds like it's going to make a difficult task easier. And then the problem is because people have these um, false expectations, then when somebody tries to share the facts with them, the facts are really not welcome. And that also is totally understandable. Nobody likes to be disappointed in their expectations. I'll give you a couple of examples. There was somebody on a public forum who was talking about gathering hundreds and hundreds of names and submitting them to the temple. And when a few of us very gently tried to suggest that the names gathered that way, that a lot of them probably weren't valid and at least they should be verified, the person responded, do you mean to tell me that the church has spent millions of dollars to make family tree and the names in it aren't even ready for temple work? So that was a shock to them and it was a huge disappointment because they had been led to believe that all they had to do was run an app and gather names out of family tree. Another uh, person that I was helping not too long ago, we sat down and they happily showed me their um, name finding results where they had, as I recall, I think around the order of 300 names that the name finding app had found. And I, he said, isn't this great? You know, I'd really like to just get these names all done. And I said, well, those uh, those names, we, I'm so glad you found those names. 
we really should verify them. There's a, a chance that some of them may not be accurate, uh, and it's always just a good idea to go through and attach some sources and so forth. And he just said, no, I, I, I'd, I'd really rather not. Uh, the names look ready to me, so I think I'm, I'm just going to go ahead. And of course, in a case like that, as a consultant, you, you can't you know, put your foot down and say, no, you're not submitting those names until you verified them. We all have our agency and we're all responsible. But I have to think that this brother had very good intentions. In fact, I know he did. I know he had very good intentions. And I have to think that one reason he felt that it was appropriate was because he had used an app that presented those names to him as apparently needing temple work. And it just seemed superfluous to him that he should need to verify those names. Now, and in, uh, for the last part of these unintent unintended consequences, I want to talk about some of the more spiritual um, downsides, if you will, to using uh, name finding apps and gathering large numbers of names. What I'm noticing among people that have done this is that they don't really get to know the people whose names they're reserving. So their hearts aren't really turned. All the, those people are is names on a list to them. And they do feel, don't get me wrong, they feel a general sense of, wow, this is great. Now their temple work can be done, and that is wonderful. But they don't know anything about these people. Where did they live? What was their life like? What did they experience that has contributed to the way I live? What sacrifices did they make that enabled me to enjoy the blessings I have today. So when we don't dig into those names as we've actually been counseled to do, then we lose something really precious. And it, in my experience, people's hearts are not turned by just submitting names from an app, and especially just by submitting large number of, numbers of names that aren't verified. Another problem that I've seen is that an app can encourage people to have that one-and-done mentality. Like the, the woman that I mentioned who, I, I don't think actually I told this whole story in this webinar, but I mentioned somebody who found 8,000 names. And this was, uh, she was a sister living in California who had been taught to find a name-finding app and didn't realize that there were some possible problems with it. And so she had just reserved all these names and shared them with the temple system and kind of thought, okay, that's done. And uh, now we just, we, you know, I've kind of fulfilled my obligation to family history. What's interesting about family history is that as Boyd K. Packer said, there is no more work, no work that is more spiritually refining. When we treat it like a one and done, I think we miss out on that spiritual refinement. We don't have that ongoing blessing of learning to recognize the spirit, of connecting with our ancestors, of discovering our family stories. And so I, I think we, we kind of rob ourselves of that blessing when we make family history into a one and done experience. And this is one, honestly, for those of you who are listening to this, I debated whether or not to share this because I've had people, uh, not very often, but again, once in a while, people have gotten offended at my bringing this up. But I've experienced it myself, and I've talked to so many other people that have experienced it that I think it's worth mentioning. And that is that when we submit invalid names for temple work, our temple experience is less meaningful. And I think there's a good reason for that. As perhaps you have, um, I've been in the temple when I have literally felt the gratitude of the person whose work I was doing. I could tell that they were pleased. I could tell that they accepted the work and were so happy about the chance to progress. I don't think I would feel that same joy and gratitude from somebody if I were doing their work for the 20th time. Uh, I had a friend who had an experience also that uh, illustrated this not too long ago. 
he had gone to the baptistry to do some family names that he had carefully researched and validated and he said that the spirit was so strong during that experience he was just overjoyed to tell that those people were happy about their temple work so after he did the the work for his ancestors he also uh, the, apparently it wasn't a very busy day and so the officiator asked if he could stay and do some other names and so he agreed gladly and started doing the names and as he did he noticed that the wonderful feelings were no longer present and that seemed strange and then as he as they went through the names what he started to notice is that there were a couple of them that were apparently the wrong gender. So for instance, they were clearly women's names that were being baptized as men. And then also there were some dates that were suspect and some places and things that you could just tell that these names had not been very carefully researched. And so for my friend, that was just another testimony that when we are careless with our family names and don't properly verify them, and then if we do work and the names turn out to be invalid, it's not going to be as meaningful of, of a temple experience. Now, the reason some people have expressed concern before is that they've misunderstood me to say, well, then you're saying the temple's not a good experience. No, that's not what I'm saying. But what I am saying is that if we're careful about doing our research and we're, we find valid names and, this, and we are guided by the Spirit in doing that work, then we're going to have an especially beautiful experience of the temple, which we might not otherwise have. So let's return, if you don't mind, to the misconception that I said was one of my greatest concerns. And that is that we're teaching people that family history is tedious and difficult. And in this particular context, people are being taught that it's tedious and difficult without the app. The truth is, Family history is tedious and difficult without the spirit. So what I'd like to do now, if you'll excuse me, what I'd like to do now is go ahead and show you an alternative approach to using name finding apps, especially to find large numbers of names. A little while ago, the church did some research and I learned about this in a presentation that I attended by a brother named Mike Sandberg who works for Family Search. He said that the church had done research on people who were not submitting any temple names at all. And suddenly they went to submitting names regularly. So naturally the church had a burning question. How did they make the transition? What enabled them to go from not submitting any names at all to successfully submitting temple names regularly? Well, what they found out was very interesting. 85% of those who made this transition had a helper, and 65% of them got help multiple times. So this church discovered that having a person to help or mentor somebody new to family history was the key to success. And so if this is sounding familiar to any of you, you will realize that this became the basis for the church's Find Take Teach program. So Find Take Teach is a spirit-led one-on-one uh, one, uh, effort where help is given by a person who um, pays the price to know how to help that person by the spirit. So let me go ahead and show you just in a little more detail why this approach works. So first of all, and I'm, and I'm simplifying this, if you want more information on this, you can um, look on FamilySearch.org. They've got a complete description of it. But very simply, the helper and the patron both pray for guidance. And then the helper prepares a personalized lesson by the Spirit. And during this lesson, also by the Spirit, they find a starting place for this person or they find valid temple names for the person. And then finally, when they get together, the helper guides the patron in a one-on-one -on -one setting to reserve those temple names. 
So I want to show you, as, as a person who uh, has responsibility currently for helping people and mentoring people, I want to show you the process that I go through to find a good starting place when I'm, help, when I'm working with somebody in a Find, Take, Teach experience. This is not the only way to do it. It's the way that works best for me. And I have other friends who uh, are equally successful in using different approaches, but I can speak to what works for me. So, And I hope that this, as an example, might be helpful to you in finding your own best approach. So the first most important thing for me is that I have to go someplace quiet where I can hear the spirit in preparing this uh, Find, Take, Teach experience. I can't be where I'm distracted. I can't be where I'm feeling pressured. I have to be in a place where I can truly feel the inspiration of the Holy Ghost. So I, I make those arrangements, whatever's taken and whatever it takes. And I have to tell you that I, um, in one of my classes, a sister said, that she actually, she can't do it at home. There's just no way, you know, even in the bathroom, it's like, knock, 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 mom, you in there? So she, what she does is she actually goes to the public library where people are supposed to be quiet. And so that place works for her. You might find a different quiet place that works for you. But whatever you do, find a place where you can be in tune with the spirit. And then I bring up the fan chart. That's my favorite place to work. And I listen for what I call heart tugs, which are spiritual promptings to me that somebody is wanting their temple work to be done. So here's an example. I had offered to help a sister at the MTC as part of a Find, Take, Teach experience there. And this sister had a very full tree. And she wasn't uh, convinced that we would be able to find anything. So I asked for her helper number, and actually the place where we were working that Sunday in the MTC was very noisy, and I knew that it was not a good place for me to really hear the spirit and find a good starting place. And so I asked for her helper number and then went to a place where I could, and, and we arranged to meet the following week, and I, I went to a place where I could um, listen to the spirit. And as I did, I, I prayed sincerely, and I had asked her to pray also with me. And so I looked at the fan chart, and I found, as I pondered and looked, and I clicked on a few different names, I found that I was drawn to this name of Abraham Chadwick. So I thought, okay, I'll, I'll follow that prompting, and I will check Abraham's person page and see what's going on there. Well, as my friend uh, mentioned, Wow, he had done a lot. As it turned out, and I had no way of knowing this, of course, he was the first member of their church to join the, or excuse me, the first member of their family to join the church. So as I looked here and read his personal history and clicked on his wife's names and his children's names, sure enough, all their work was done. And it was evident that he was a good, faithful man from reading his testimony. So I thought, wow, this might be harder than I thought. But I continued to pray and ask the Spirit for guidance to be led to that place where the Spirit wanted me to work for my dear sister in the MTC. And as I did, again, just another line upon line gentle prompting, I found that I was led to this name of Sarah Ann Chadwick. So I looked at that, and this is what I found. I uh, She had a husband, George Bradbury, and they had, uh, what's that, six kids? and. Uh, all their work was done too. So I, I'm so grateful that by this point I had learned better how to recognize the spirit because in my younger days I might have doubted myself and just said, wow, I've been digging around here and I'm not finding anything. So I, that might not really have been the spirit. I, I might have questioned myself. But because I had fortunately tried really hard to grow in, in my ability, and I'm by, far from perfect, but I'd really tried to grow in my ability to hear the Spirit. I trusted these promptings. So I thought, okay, I'm going to keep going. I am not sure why, because this isn't looking too good, but I'm going to keep trying. So I clicked on the first name, of uh, their first son, and that's when I started to feel um, that I was that I was going the right direction, and so the first thing, of course, that that caught my attention was that Samuel's wife didn't even have a last name, so that indicated that more research definitely needed to be done, and I noticed that uh, they didn't have many children. Back in 
this time in this in the 1800s most families had large uh, most families had a large number of children so with just a little bit of research it wasn't like i took days and days in fact i don't think it was even hours it was just a little quick checking in um, ancestry and families uh, family search historical records it didn't take long to discover that Samuel and Kate were missing four children from family tree. And these children were not there and needed to be added so that their temple work could be done. And I thought, OK, that is why I got that prompting. And I think the reason I was prompted to start with Abraham was that if I got a prompting, like suppose that the name Samuel Bradbury came into my mind, I would have not had a clue what to do with it. And so the Spirit led me along a path where I could see how this family first got involved with the church and then how these people who needed their ordinances were related to that first convert. So this was just a wonderful, beautiful experience in finding these names. And then also, as I did more research, sorry, got a little ahead there. As I did more research, I found in the 1911 census that Kate had died. And so Samuel had remarried, and his second wife, Ada Sarah, was not in family tree either. And her temple work needed to be done. So just from following that prompting, I was able to find and verify these five names and um, pass those on to the sister in the MTC so that she could get that temple work done. Another example on this family was that when I looked at Hannah, Samuel's younger sister, she did not have a spouse. A, again, just a little bit of research. This wasn't hours of looking through court records or something. This was doing a search on ancestry in available censuses. In just a short period of time, I discovered that at one point, Hannah had been living with her mother. And so there was the, um, the, the obvious proof there, I mean, the definite proof that this really was my Hannah that I was looking for, and found out that she, she did have a husband, and they had three children together. So right there were four more names, four valid names that needed to be added to family tree. So that is an example of how to follow the spirit to find a place to work in family tree but i was mentioning this to a dear sister in my stake who i was um, helping get started with family history and this is what she said i don't think i'm that good at hearing the spirit now i have to tell you something about this sister she is amazing she serves people she's wonderful i don't think she was giving herself enough credit but I think all of us have felt that kind of sense of inadequacy. I know I certainly did, especially when I was first starting to really try to follow the spirit in family history. Well, fortunately, we all learn to hear the spirit line upon line. Wherever you are in learning to, to follow the spirit, wherever I am, that's where we can that's a place to start growing from. In fact, it's the only place we can start growing from is where we are. So we all learn to hear the Spirit line upon line. And to me, that is just such good news because that's doable. I can do that. I can grow line upon line. And the wonderful thing that I have found about family history, and to me, this is one of its greatest, greatest blessings, is that it is simply one of the best tutorials in learning to hear the Spirit. I could give you dozens of examples on this, but I won't. I've actually got a whole other webinar on that, and I'm, I'll show you that at the end of the, not the webinar, I'll show you the link at the end of this one. And if you would like to, you can, can watch that. But I just, I have found that the Spirit, as I've listened to the Spirit in doing family history, I, I've learned more about how the Spirit speaks to me, and that knowledge has grown over the years as I continue to hear promptings and discern them correctly, and sometimes not correctly. I learn from making mistakes, too. But the thing that I want, the point that I wanted to make is that family history is one of the best, very best tutorials in learning to hear the Spirit. And if we don't, try to follow the spirit and family history then we lose one of those great that we lo lose that great opportunity of refining our ability to hear and hearing the spirit better brings blessings in all areas of our lives 
I love this quote uh, by Joseph Smith, and it's actually something that I have experienced in doing family history. And that is that a person may profit by noticing the first intimation or the first hint of the spirit of revelation. It may give you sudden strokes of ideas like call so-and-so or sit here at this meeting because you don't know this, but you are going to find somebody to help you with temple names. Or there's a mistake in your record. Go back and check it. So it may give you these sudden strokes of ideas so that by noticing it, you find it fulfilled. So you find that that prompting you got was a real prompting because whatever it told you about was true. So you find it fulfilled the same day or soon, and thus, by learning the Spirit of God and understanding it, you may grow into the principle of revelation. And it's my testimony that this is absolutely true and that doing family history gives you the opportunity to grow in, in hearing revelation in this way. So, closing thoughts. This is a, 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 not a concern exactly, but it's something that comes up from time to time when we talk about the problems with uh, misusing name-finding apps. So the person will say, but the app I'm using is certified by FamilySearch. Doesn't that mean that it finds valid names? And that's understandable why people would think that, because certified, the word certified, sounds really official, doesn't it? It sounds like there's some kind of guarantee on the app that it's going to perform as I expect it to. But that's actually not the case. The short answer is no, being certified doesn't guarantee finding valid names. And in fact, it doesn't even have anything to do with valid names. Let's take a look at what Family Search certification means. So this is a direct quote from the Family Search certification site. The reason most people probably don't re read this is that it's geared towards developers. So most of us don't have any reason to go out to the site. But listen to what it says. The designation is simply used to identify software applications that FamilySearch believes to be generally compatible with FamilySearch or its application programming interfaces, which is basically the way that the programs talk to each other. So FamilySearch believes that this app is generally compatible, but FamilySearch takes no responsibility and is no way liable for any such application. Accordingly, FamilySearch in no way warrants that these applications will function as intended or that they are free from harmful or undesirable aspects or free from errors. So. The, all, the reason I bring this up is just to help us understand that to say an app is FamilySearch certified is a wonderful thing, and it does mean something specific. It means that you can generally count on it to work correctly with FamilySearch.org uh, FamilySearch website, but it does not guarantee anything about the app being used in a certain way or misused or any problems that might result from its use. Here's another thing that I hear sometimes. Uh, in talking with a couple of different app developers or reading their websites, they say, well, I'm an app developer and my app warns people that they should research the names that they find, so isn't that enough? And you would hope that it would be, right? You would hope that everybody reads the fine print. But my experience is, and even <clears throat> my own experience is, that I don't always read the fine print. Sometimes if I'm in a hurry, I just, or I just glance at it and think, OK, I don't have time for this or whatever. My experience is that most people don't read the warnings, not only for, for these apps, but for kind of anything. In fact, I'll give you an example. The other day, I was helping somebody in a fine take teach experience, and several warnings came up during the process of our working together. And the person I was helping just clicked right past the warnings. And the sense that I got was that they felt that they would not have understood the warnings anyway, so why bother to read them? So it was maybe a little sense of um, you know, technophobia or inadequacy or whatever, but for whatever reason, most people don't read the warnings on these apps or anyplace else. 
I've also found that the few people who read the warnings don't really understand how to apply it because often the main users of name finding apps are people who are just getting started in family history and somebody has told them about the app and said this is a quick and easy way to find temple names. So they get to the app and if they read the warning they go oh okay I, I'll, I'll, I'll research whatever that means. And so they uh, reserve their 100 names or whatever, and then they look at a, the list of 100 and they go, well, looks fine to me. Um, I'm not really sure what I'm looking for, but I don't see any problems, so I guess I'll go ahead. And we can't fault people for that because if they're just getting started and they don't understand, then they're doing their best to follow the warning, but they didn't really understand what the app developer meant by the warning. So that that's an example of how just putting a warning on an app doesn't really help solve the problem of the app being misused to find invalid names or large numbers of names. So at this point, you might be asking yourself, well, what if I submitted a lot of names, like the dear sister in California that had submitted 8,000 names gathered with a name finding app? Well, if the names are in your reservation list, verify them. So you've got them. There's no reason to not go through and um, check them out, but verify them. What that means is not just kind of looking at them and going, well, I don't see any problems, but rather going back and verifying, is the vital information correct? Is it supported by sources? Are the relationships correct? Are there any obvious problems like the mom having kids when she's age four? So verifying those names, you can't really verify names en masse. You need to verify them individually, just like when the Savior had the, the individuals come to him. When he appeared in the Americas, they came one by one. We also need to verify names one by one and make sure that they're correct. So that, of course, is not necessarily a short process, especially if you have 8,000 names in your temple queue. So if it's going to take longer than two years before the names will be re re released by the church, then you probably would want to put those names back in Family Search and let other people go ahead and reserve them. And hopefully they would reserve just a few and they would carefully verify them. If the ordinances are already done, don't worry about it. Don't beat yourself up. I, I know of people who have beat themselves up, like a sister I'm aware of who found out that she had, after um, reserving Green Temple names and doing about 30 ordinances, a cousin contacted her and said, did you realize you just did all this duplicate work? Those names were done years ago. And she was so hurt and so frustrated and so disappointed because she had been told that the right thing to do was just gather these green names and that she didn't need to verify them. So she was so hurt and disappointed that she exclaimed, I am never doing family history again. Now, hopefully, after she thought about it, of course, um, she changed her mind. You know, that was hopefully just said in the disappointment of the moment. But that's what we don't want to do, is beat ourselves up. If you've done some of these names, especially if you did them with the best of intentions, consider it a learning experience and just say, OK, that's water under the bridge. Going forward, I'll, I'll know better what to do. And you can help people that you talk to be aware of these problems so that they don't run into the same types of issues. So then your next question might be, are you saying that I should never use a name finding app? And no, I'm not saying that because it is possible to use name finding apps to find valid names. It's just that in my experience, and this is anecdotal, so this is just my experience as a state uh, temple and family history consultant, an award consultant in a number of different wards and so forth, it's been my experience that they usually aren't used to find valid names. Most of the time, the people who are using them have been told that it's a fast and easy way to find temple names, and they're not told about verification. So if I use a name finding app, how can I find valid names? You can. So here are some tips for finding valid names with name finding apps. First of all, most importantly, seek the guidance of the spirit. I have uh, known, I know a woman who started to use 
a name finding app and the spirit told her not to. Now that was specifically for her situation. That should not be generalized to anybody else in any other situation. That was just in hers, but she was told not to and that if she had disobeyed the spirit in that, that would have been a mistake for her. So you want to seek the guidance of the spirit in using the name finding apps. And if you're warned not to use them, then don't. On the other hand, if you're told to use them by a, a definite spiritual prompting, then absolutely do. Verify each and every name carefully that you find. So verify the vital information, the relationships, check for duplicates, add sources. Make sure that the vital information agrees with the sources. And <clears throat> here's a tip is to use one or more names as a starting point to find and add more names. So you can find maybe a couple of names using a name finding app and then go back to Family Tree and thoroughly research those names and see if anybody's missing. Kind of as we did in the example that I showed you of the uh, Find Take Teach experience in the MTC. And then finally, what I found is that it really helps to work on one family at a time rather than a large risk list of random names. The reason it's helpful to work on one family at a time is that you get to know that family. You become familiar with the place that they lived, with what they did for a living, with how many children they had, with when their kids left home and got married and so forth. And so as you follow this family through time, you know, as you find their birth records, their census records, their death records, all those different things that help you know that family, then you're able to correctly find the information for them, validate those names, and add them to family tree. And I felt so much more comfortable working in family units to add names to family tree rather than just working from a, a mass list of random names that are just in whatever order they were found by the name finding app. So therefore what? Do you remember President Packer used to say this a lot? So what are the takeaways that I hope that we'll get from this webinar? Well, if you are a user of a name finding app, the takeaways are I hope that you would be aware of the potential problems that we've talked about today and also that you'd help others be aware because there's so many misconceptions going around. That you would use these um, apps as guided by the Spirit. That you would remember that are, there are so many names that still need to be added to Family Tree. That you would realize that a good helper can help you in a way that an app can't and that you would remember that technology doesn't replace thought, research, research, or the spirit. As amazing as technology is, it's not perfect, and we need to use it as a tool and as a companion to our spiritual efforts, but not as a replacement for them. If you are a developer, what would I hope that you would take away from this webinar today? I would love to see developers educate people about the data in Family Tree to combat those misconceptions. Again, I don't think most developers are setting out to tell people wrong uh, facts about the data in Family Tree. They're not meaning to communicate uh, misconceptions. But users pick them up anyway, especially when they're um, shared word of mouth from user to user or posted on Facebook or wherever. So app developers could do a huge favor to users by educating them about the data in Family Tree. Also, teach people that Family Tree is not meant to be a primary source for finding names. Yes, there are some green, valid Green Temple names in Family Tree, but Family Tree was never intended to be a primary source of temple names so that we don't have to find our own family or do our own research. I would love it if app developers did not give users the impression that family history without the app is difficult and tedious. Again, family history is only difficult and tedious if we don't have the spirit. Well, let me take that back on difficult. Like I said, there can be challenges, especially in some time periods and some places. But what I've found is that if you follow the spirit, 
you'll be led to solve those problems and there's a sense of joy and there's also it's not difficult in a horrible way it's difficult in a challenging and invigorating way so I would love for this misconception to be done away with in the church that family history is synonymous with difficult and tedious I would also love it if apps put caps on the number of names that they found. And I'm aware of some that do, but to my understanding, there are some that don't, that allow users to just um, grab huge numbers of names and submit them for temple work. I would also, and I was actually talking with some friends the other day about the, the problems that we continue to see with people submitting large numbers of invalid names using name finding apps and I would love it we would love it if there was some kind of feature that would allow people to clean up those uh, large numbers of invalid names that have been submitted whether it was you know some super duplicate search or something I don't know this is just this was on our wish list we thought it would just be so wonderful if there was some way to, to clean up those many invalid names that have been submitted I would like to close with a quote from David Rencher, who is currently the Chief Genealogical Officer at FamilySearch. He said, I love my computer. I love it for everything it can do for me. But the computer is not what turns my heart. What turns my heart are the experiences and the impressions I have from the spirit and the things that I know and understand. So that concludes our webinar for today. I just wanted to share with you those promised additional resources. The first one is a list of other webinars that you can get on this link down at the bottom. And they are webinars that go into more detail about what we've talked about today. The first one, uh, oh, let me backtrack on that. Many times people use name finding apps because they've been told that it is the only way to find success as a beginner. And unfortunately, I've even seen this attitude among consultants where they will say, it is too hard to teach a beginner to do careful family history. They're going to get discouraged and they won't do it. And so therefore, I have to teach them to use a name finding app. Well, of course, Find Take Teach has turned that on its head. Uh, as a, a helper prepares a spirit-led find Tate teach experience to find valid names, beginners do learn to do valid family history. So this, uh, that first webinar kind of touches on that subject. The second one dives more into using the Holy Ghost and family history, uh, duplicates and family tree, obviously, and then the last one. Uh, goes into a lot more detail on understanding the data in Family Tree, where it came from, and what some of the additional challenges are with it. And then lastly, I want to recommend to you this amazing book that I just love. It's available at Deseret Book. It's called Hearts Turn to the Fathers, and it's a history of family history <laughs> since the Restoration. So it starts out from the beginning of the Restored Gospel to about the 1990s when uh, the book was published and when Family Search was just uh, gaining traction. So if you love family history, I think you would love this book. So thank you everybody for your time and attention today. And I hope that this, this webinar is helpful to you. Hope that it makes your family history more meaningful and more successful. Thank you. Okay, thank you so much to Catherine for that wonderful presentation. I would just like to remind everybody that these webinars will be uploaded onto YouTube and our channel name is BYU Family History Library. If you could, before you leave the webinar today, if you could just look at the different polls that we have down at the bottom of the screen. Um, we'd love to hear any feedback that you have um, or suggestions to different topics that you'd like us to cover in the future. Um, that would be very helpful for us and our different presenters. Um, and again, thanks to Catherine for that, that wonderful presentation today, and we hope to see you guys at our next webinar. All right, bye.